morning. Thank you for joining us at Catalyst Church. We're so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Will you join us as we call upon the Lord, who is the only one that can save? Come on, sing this out. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name This we know This we know You promise never to forsake What you begin you will sustain This we know This we know And
name this morning.
also know we are made in your image, and without your image, we are nothing. But it's you dwelling inside of us that gives us the capacity to grow, to meet your will, to help those in need, to be your hand in this world. And God, we just thank you for that great responsibility and that great gift that we can all carry you and strive to be more like you each and every day. Amen. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Catholic Church, come on. We just remain in agitative worship and prayer for a moment. In fact, I want before we go into prayer, I want to I want to address something really quick. Maybe you you know, I don't want to turn this into a deep theology lesson, but you might be surprised at how little power is actually ascribed to the enemy of our souls. Go through scripture, go through God's word and look through and see what kind of power and authority does he actually have versus what has he convinced us that he has. You might be surprised to discover that he actually has very little power, very little authority. Now, I'm not gonna diminish for a second the fact that so many of us, many of you right now even feel that his power seems to be limitless. But the truth is that his power is not limitless. His power is incredibly limited. In fact, it's very much limited. We have, however, one with us who has no limits to his power. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, can I challenge you to take back from the enemy that which wasn't his in the first place? He doesn't actually have the authority to oppress the way he thinks he does and the way he has convinced you and I so often that he does. The truth is that our God is the one with the power and he sets free. I don't know what area in your life this morning you need to take back territory from the enemy. But let's lay hold of the truth that our God is capable. Our God is all powerful. Our God loves us such that no matter what territory it is, it belongs to us. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you so much that we can come to you with confidence, knowing that you are the one who holds authority. You are the one who has the power. Lord, many of us have areas of our lives, whether it's health and finances, whether it's relationships, whether it's vision and direction, so many different things, that the enemy has convinced us that we have lost territory. The enemy has convinced us that his power cannot be thwarted. But the truth is, Lord, that he's lying. He doesn't have that power. So Jesus, this morning, we look to you, our authority. We submit to you. And we ask you, Jesus, would you lead us back into the victory that has been ours all along? Holy Spirit, in this moment, would you, would you show us those areas of our life where we have been fooled into believing a lie? Open our, the eyes of our hearts and our minds. Open the very eyes of our spirit that we would see the authority in Jesus Christ that has been given to us to lay hold of the territory that belongs to us. Holy Spirit, that we would see it and know it and understand it and claim hold of that which is ours. We declare healing over sickness and disease. We declare victory over bondage. We declare provision over finances. We declare healing over relationships, wholeness and restoration. And we lay hold of it in Jesus' name and in Jesus' authority. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you the honor and the glory because they belong to you. Hallelujah. 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 Catalyst Church, amen and amen. Welcome. We're so glad you could be with us again yet this morning. We're so glad to have you. You honor us simply by choosing to be a part of our online gatherings week in and week out, and we just want to say thank you for that. If you're a first-time guest especially, thank you for making the choice to join us this morning. We greatly appreciate all that you have done to make this, uh, uh, this moment a priority. 
We'd love to connect with you. Take a moment if you wouldn't mind, and you can do it a few different ways. You can send an email to our connections team. It's connect at catalystchurch.life. You can text the word catalyst to our connections number, 509-385-0811, and our connections team which wants to, to welcome you and help you become a part of the Catalyst Church family. Can we go to the Lord this morning? Thank you for your faithfulness in giving the tithes and offerings. I want to pray a blessing over you and your finances and your household, your income, your career, your job, your business, everything. Father, we thank you that you are the one who provides in and out, day and in and day out. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Holy Spirit, thank you as you teach us the, the stewardship principles of the Word of God. As we honor our Lord with the tithes and with the offerings, we know that they, the resources will be leveraged forward into transformed lives by the power of the gospel. And unashamedly, Lord, I'm asking for blessings to be poured out upon your faithful people. Lord, I pray for a windfall income. I pray for profitability in their businesses. I pray for the provision of jobs and raises and promotions. Lord, really what I'm asking is that your favor would fall upon the finances of your people, bringing attention and glory to you. That's my prayer. We thank you for, Lord, as we honor you with the tithes and offerings. We bring glory to your name in that way. It is in Jesus' name we receive, in Jesus' name certainly that we give. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Well, Catalyst Church, it's good to see you again this morning. You know, speaking of stewardship of, of uh, financial principles, so in an effort to be better stewards of God's resources, our pastoral staff is right now in the process of switching our mobile phone carrier you know, the one we've had, you know, we've been with it for many, 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 many years, um, and it has simply become too expensive, uh, you know, really to justify continuing with it. Maybe you've experienced something similar, you know, in this. But So I was totally unprepared, however, for what happened in this process of switching carriers. The new carrier took care of everything for me. I didn't even have to, like, I didn't even have to do a breakup call. They handled all of that. It was so nice and so clean. You know, it was seamless. It was simple. In fact, it's almost like they made the decision for me. It was, so, it was so easy for me to break up with our phone carrier. So, hey, you know, we're continuing our exploration of the, uh, the trust me, by the way, that, there's a point to my intro story there. But we're continuing with our exploration of this uncommon series, the, the chosen character of a Christ follower. And we're examining today a, what I fear is a concept that has been lost to the ravages of the digital age and a consumer approach to seemingly all things. I'm talking about loyalty. Just like the, the phone, our new phone carrier made it incredibly easy for me to be disloyal to our old one. You know, loyalty is really, uh, I think it's the active expression of faithfulness. You know, where faithfulness is how our, our mind or how our heart holds true to something that we believe. Loyalty is how we display that belief. And we live out that commitment. You know, so you know, think, think of a, a, you know, a loyalty of exclusivity. It, that's, that's, the, that's the active proof of faithfulness you know, in heart and mind within a, a marriage. You know, loyalty in a friendship you know, isn't really something that you can declare. I mean, of course, you can use the words, but you declare it. You show your loyalty in friendship. You prove your loyalty in a friendship. And I would say it's probably a safe guess that everyone in the sound of my voice today has felt the sting of disloyalty. When another one proves, often quite painfully, the, the true status of the, their dedication, you know, and their fidelity toward us. Culturally, you know, it's kind of funny, we joke about Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I'm going to continue anyways, even though the Holy Spirit's probably telling me to stop. I'm going to keep going. Culturally, you know, we joke about, you know, sometimes we joke about women being, you know, kind of catty, you know, and, you know, 
kind of cruel to one another, especially during you know, their tumultuous younger years, like between 9 and 89 or so. Uh, you know, but the truth is, it crosses all the gen- it crosses. Did I just say crosses all the genders? I think I did. You know, it tells you how, how, how thoroughly I have been enculturated. All of the genders. There's two. Anyways, that was a totally different story. Disloyalty crosses the gender gap just fine. You know, when the Apostle Paul was in Rome, he was awaiting trial for proclaiming the gospel. And he wrote to Timothy, you know, who was in uh, Ephesus, in one little verse that's very easily skipped over accurately depicts what I think so many of us have felt at times. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Timothy. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, this little, oh, it, it seems like such a little detail, but it matters. The, uh, verse 16, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, the first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, none of us will ever be hauled before the emperor of Rome. Like Paul was. But we each have faced moments when we felt abandoned or forsaken, haven't we? You know, this wasn't the only time for Paul either. You know, just a few verses earlier. In fact, let's, uh, let's go over there to verse, let's go over there to verse 10. You know, verse 9, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. He's writing to Timothy. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Demas has deserted me. You know, adversity often reveals the true nature of things. Paul had a a very large traveling entourage that was on the missionary journeys with him. And many of his companions revealed the truth of their dedication through their disloyalty. And if we want to be really accurate, they revealed the truth of what kind of character they had. As does Paul. Look at his words. May it not be counted against them. That's a, that's a tough response to pull out of our betrayed heart, isn't it? You know, after you know, my wife Bobby had a stroke a couple of years ago, in fact, we just passed the, the two-year anniversary of that, you know, after her stroke, we learned that she actually had two physical heart defects, which combined created the perfect recipe for, you know, throwing a, a blood clot, thus a stroke. And we are absolutely beyond grateful to God for his mercy and his grace, you know, in that time. The time, however, between her stroke and, and the diagnosis and then the, the, the surgery that corrected the problem was a time of learning many things, um, all manner of new things, actually, and some of which were very interesting, some rather difficult, but none of the things we learned, however, were as difficult as the unmistakable lessons of who our friends actually were. We had some who displayed their total care, total commitment to us, as we probably would have expected and anticipated from them. We actually had some whose apparent apathy surprised us. We even had a few who actually used the opportunity to actively cause harm. We can relate to Paul's emotions far too readily as he grappled with the disloyalty of of supposed friends, supposed companions. You know, Paul had many who traveled with him as he advanced the gospel until he was condemned. And that's when he found himself utterly alone. You know, when the sun is shining, you know, you know, and you're walking in, in prosperity or whatever. That's when everyone wants to be your, your friend. I mean, try this. Try, everyone do this. Try winning the lottery. Just go ahead and do that really quick, would you? See how many friends, friends, suddenly go from Facebook likes 
to knocks on your front door because, you know, of course, you know, you'll, you'll discover how quickly an email or a text simply is not adequate to display their utter devotion to you. If you've ever been deserted in a time of need, though you, know, you probably know then how Paul felt. Thankfully, however, Paul doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in that cynical place of despairing over disloyalty. In fact, look there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's pick it back up at verse 17. What does he say? But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. But the Lord stood with me. No example in Scripture gets more airtime than Jesus himself being betrayed, forsaken by his own followers. He's betrayed for a, you know, a bag of, of silver coins by Judas Iscariot. He's den- he is denied actively by Peter. The crowds who had cheered him on only a week earlier have turned and they now demand his crucifixion. In fact, look at these, these stark words from Mark. In Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 14, verse 50. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. When Jesus was being arrested. You know, I've declared many times from, from this pulpit, the proper response to abuse is proper use, not disuse. In the context of loyalty, then, the proper response for you and I when we are confronted with the disloyalty of others is not for us to, you know, stiff arm everyone Stiff arm the world, hold them all at bay. You know, put up our guard or generally punish everyone for the actions of of a select few. Our temptation is is to to guard our hearts, isn't it? You know, and and our emotions by, by putting on our cynical, you know, mistrusting hat to remain aloof, to remain detached. And that's no way to go through life and we know it. Why not? Why not? Well, the truth is that when we stiff arm the world, when we put on the cynicism, it dishonors the innocent. It falsely lumps them in, you know, with the same category as the perpetrators. Remember what I said about about Demos and what Paul discovered and what his companions declared about their character. At least, if nothing else, it, display, it, it treats them as potential perpetrators. How is that fair? Just because a few select individuals are disloyal. It also destroys community starving ourselves, starving others from the the vital nutrient of trust. Did you know there there can be no community? Certainly not. Absolutely not a God-honoring, Christ-centric, missional community without the critical element of trust. And most importantly, as we, especially as we consider this uncommon, the, the, the chosen character of the Christ follower, Most importantly, that attitude of cynicism, of detachment, of protecting ourselves constantly, guarding, it actually denigrates Christ, denigrates Christ. Christ whom we claim to follow, whom we claim to know, whom we claim to be modeling and following our our lives after. So, So what do we do then? What do you and I do when we are confronted with disloyalty? Well, we cannot fix disloyalty by focusing on disloyalty. We correct this particular character flaw 
by focusing on what we desire, which is loyalty. But what if we cannot seem to find loyalty? Or we, we have maybe become so jaded in our perception that we seem to miss it. Or our perception even becomes corrupted. What do we do then? Well, we look to the one whose loyalty is renowned. We look to God himself. To God, the locus of loyalty. Not locust like the bug, but locus like the center point. You know, a locus is the place where something occurs or something is situated. And I think of loyalty, you can't come up with a better example than God himself. You know, the Old Testament is filled with stories of God's enduring loyalty to his people, to his people as a whole and to individuals specifically. I think of the the three Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You know, when they took a stand against King Nebuchadnezzar, and his demands for idolatry. Their protest landed them in a a fiery furnace. Yet who was with them in the midst of the flames? God. How about Daniel? Similar, Daniel is being urged, even commanded, to compromise his singularity of devotion to God to which he refuses, which ends him up in a lion's den to be eaten. And who delivers him? God. How about Joseph? Joseph is actively betrayed by his brothers. He's falsely accused. He's wrongly imprisoned. And who remains the constant in Joseph's life? You've probably caught the pattern by now. It's God. And we could go on and on and on. And each time, we're going to discover a pattern. God's presence and God's activity in the life of those who remain steadfastly loyal to him. You know, consumer Christianity would have us believe that God is always waiting to serve us. He's, whenever we desire something, whenever we need something, whenever we want something, he's right there just waiting to serve us. The truth is, he is always waiting. But he waits for signs of our obedience. He waits for signs of our loyalty to him. Not so he can serve us, but rather so that he can pour out his blessings upon and through us. Now, there's a balance. In fact, let's go there. Second Chronicles, way back in the Old Testament. In Second Chronicles chapter 15, Let me read a few verses. The spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin. Catch this. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Wow. Wow. Whenever you seek him, you will find him, but if you abandon him, he will abandon you. That was the word to Israel then. Is that true today? Is there a balance there? God's favor, God's blessing, God's presence somehow tied to our obedience, our loyalty to him? I mean, there's echoes of that. There's patterns of that all throughout Scripture. Huh. You know, there's a principle in scripture interpretation that declares essentially the number of times something is mentioned in the Bible is usually a good indicator of how important that thing is or how important it is to God. Now, it's not a hard, fast rule at all, but it is kind of a good starting place. If it happens a lot, it matters a lot. You know what the most frequent promise made by God in all of Scripture is, I will be with you. That promise occurs more than anything else. I will be with you. In fact, it occurs so frequently, it's kind of easily dismissed as like a, a narrative filler or something like that, which that would be a huge mistake on our part to dismiss it like that. 
Let me fine-tune this so we don't miss it. In his word, he declares and shows his loyalty toward us more than he even declares his love for us. I'm not saying loyalty is more important than his love. Remember what I said earlier, that loyalty is the active expression of faithfulness. So clearly we see his love even in his loyalty. But he promises his loyalty more than he even promises his love as far as frequency. And I don't think I'm misspeaking then when I declare apparently loyalty is kind of a big deal to God. If his most frequent self-description is, I am the God who will be with you. Apparently it's kind of a big deal. I mean, seriously, the only way he could like make it any clearer is if he like named his, own, his only son something like God with us. You know, Emmanuel. Oh, wait. Isn't that exactly what he did? You know, after the, the resurrection when Jesus was giving his disciples and honestly giving us the, the final marching orders, if you will, the Great Commission, you know what the last thing he says is? In Matthew, it's recorded there, Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, what does he say? Ha, be sure of this. Nope, it's in the wrong spot. I did it again. Come on. <laughs> Matthew 28, thank you. I told I've said this before, I study in a different Bible than I preach out of. And you would really think that all the books would be where they're supposed to be. There we go. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. We've heard that so many times. We've preached on that so many times. You know, we're used to hearing it. But don't forget the last thing he says, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. So how do you and I grow in loyalty? Well, number one, just do it. <laughs> Specifically, don't try to convince yourself that you are loyal. Show your loyalty. Proclaiming to yourself that you are a loyal person is kind of a false sense of devotion. Loyal people help out. They help out when needed. Loyal people, loyal people even sometimes help out when they're not needed. Loyal people proactively invest in their relationships. They make a priority of spending time. They just do it. They also just show up. You know, sometimes people don't actually need anything from us beyond having us with them, beyond our presence in the midst of their difficulty. Some things simply cannot be fixed. You know, the loss of a loved one, you know, maybe a, a catastrophe occurs, things of that nature. You're not going to fix it, and they don't need you to fix it. Because sometimes what is needed most is the simple knowledge and the awareness that we are not alone in those times. Just show up. And also, just stick around. You know, it's human nature to, to kind of distance ourselves from danger, distance ourselves from discomfort when someone is going through a hard time. That's, it's, it's pretty common, you know? So don't beat yourself up for having the, you know, that flight response when someone else is in a dire difficulty. It's totally normal to, to react that way. It's totally human. Totally human, sinful nature, actually. But you and I, when we have chosen Christ, we've set aside our sin nature. So even though it is a normal human response to feel that desire to pull away from someone who is in the middle of difficulty, it is not the Christ-following response. Let me quote, quote a brilliant modern theologian. 
The player's going to play, 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 play. The hater's going to hate, 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 hate. Heartbreaker's going to break. Faker's going to fake. I, I myself, I was not aware that Taylor Swift had such intimate knowledge of the book of Proverbs and the book of James. But apparently she does. People do what they are. Let that sink in. People do what they are. You and I, we are what we do. When it comes to loyalty, what you and I blah, 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 or how many times we click like, or how many times we text an emoji, means absolutely nothing. Deserters desert. Forsakers forsake. Quitters quit. Friends befriend. Companions accompany. Followers follow. Disciples disciple. Loyalists loyal. That probably isn't actually a verb. And the list could go on and on and on, couldn't it? You and I we are what we do. It is uncommon for us to choose purposely to be something other than what we are. And that's exactly what it means to be a Christ follower. We are choosing purposely to be something other than what we are. I'm going to close. I'm going to invite our worship team to make their way back. Let me share with you a proverb You know, the surest way to grow in loyalty is to experience loyalty. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, I like how the, the New King James Version words this. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That friend is Jesus. No matter what our so-called friends or family or, or you know, do, we, Jesus will never forsake us. He will always be with us. It's in his very name, God with us, Emmanuel. The surest way to grow in loyalty is to experience loyalty. I said earlier, pretty confident that every single one of us has felt the very painful sting of disloyalty. I could probably even go out on a limb and say every one of us thinks of ourselves as being a loyal person. And I hope we are. I, for one, am not willing, however, to simply hope. Personally, I'm determined to grow in loyalty, which means I'm determined to grow closer to the one who is the locus of loyalty, God himself. I am determined to grow in Christ. And I want to invite you as well to grow in your relationship with the loyal God. The one who promises more than anything else that he will be with us. He will be with you. Never will he leave us, never will he forsake us. Can you believe that? Can you, can you lay hold of that? If you've never experienced the loyalty of Christ, I want to invite you into that relationship. I want to invite you to experience what so many of us have already experienced. The loyalty of a friend that is way different than friendship that we are used to. If that's you today, would you take a moment, would you pray with me? Ask Jesus into your heart, into your life. Ask him to become a friend like no other. Let's pray together. Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. I need to experience the loyalty that only you can do, only you can bring. I want to grow in that 
character quality of loyalty so different than the world. So Jesus, I invite you. Come into my heart, my mind, my life, my soul. Come into me. Forgive me of my sin nature. Forgive me of my shortcomings and failings of my sin. Cleanse me of anything that doesn't look like you. As I take up a new character, a new transformed heart and life, I follow you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you something? Scripture is so clear that when you and I pray that way with authenticity, sincerity, when we invite Jesus in, we are a born-again child of God. We want to celebrate with you. You'll see some instructions there on your screen how you can reach out to us. Let us know about your decision to follow Jesus. We have a, a resource we'd like to send your way called Start Dreaming. We want to celebrate with you and for all of us together today. Come on, let's sing these words to God. They are so critical to our heart and to our mind, to our very soul, that we can lay hold of the fact that our God is with us. Come on, church, will you join our worship team this morning? Hallelujah. He's with us. God is with us. Sometimes I feel it. Sometimes I don't. You know, in his word, he doesn't promise that we will feel his presence always. He just promises he will be with us always. My prayer is that you and I, as we go forward today, we go into a week, I pretty much guarantee you, we will have opportunity to show who we are. To our family, to our friends, our coworkers, neighbors, our classmates, you and I will have opportunity to show exactly who we are as Christ followers in this arena of loyalty. So you know what? Let's do it. Let's go into this week assuming that we are exposing others to the loyalty of Christ through our actions, through our choices, through our decisions, to just do it, just show up, and just stick around. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to worship and gather together in your name to grow further and deeper in our faith and our practice as we follow hard after Jesus. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a fantastic week, Catalyst Church. Go in grace. Hallelujah.